Eswell, Lumlamlu Ulelak Telsquik, Tilito Kwa Chiakto, Norman Kester Roberto Squalix Tishwawali, Duncan Kester Beatrice Squalix Sisla Ek. My name in, uh, I carry an ancestral name, Lum Lamalu, that comes from uh, a, a lightning story. Um, my ancestor that carried that name was born in the middle of a thunder, and a major thunder and lightning store, a storm on the banks of the Fraser River, which we call Stalo, but is being called now the Fraser River. And she was a twin to Walaylak the fifth, and he was born one month earlier on the banks of the Veda River area. And then they were down there preparing fish and out she popped. And so I'm, we, I don't know the exact translation of the name Lum Lamalut, but she just, uh, she's buried just uh, like a half a block from where I live. And she worked tirelessly for the community and she never married and she helped her brother doing, because he, he was one of the great uh, leaders of the time. So, um, and Walelak is my father's name. In English, it's Wilek, uh, but I use, and I've always used the Walelak name, uh, which is in Upper River Hakamelan. And uh, my mom, so my father is Stolo, uh, or considered Stolo, or Stalo, they say it in different ways, um, from Chiacton, which means fish weir, and because we had a big fish weir river ran through there at one time. And we originated from Chilliwack Lake, and we were the caretakers of that lake. There was two villages, one on the south and one on the north side. And all of the, um, it said that all of the shualams or the doctors and healers would come from all of what we now consider Salish and territory from like Montana and uh, up in the interior of British Columbia or Vancouver Island, and they'd all go there to practice and encourage their uh, spiritual connection and, and powers and gain strength from this area. And they have what's in the lake uh, called water babies, which are supernatural beings that reside in there. And it's a very special, uh, powerful lake. So over the course of about 250 years, we migrated down the valley, what's now called the Chilliwack Valley, into Stolo territory. And uh, Stolo, of course, again, means river. So it's people of the river. And my grandfather, well, first of all, the reason we moved was because of geographical uh, changes that were taking place. There was a lot of landslides and a lot of shifting and moving and so of, of the earth. And so that caused us to move down uh, and get further and further into the Stalo. But my uh, original ancestral language is Tlacholosum, which is um, the, what they now call the Nooksack language, which was is now in the, considered in the United States part of, um, and then we adapted into the uh, Upper Rahakamelan uh, speaking language, is what I speak now. And um, the story I was telling you was about Tikwalatsa, who was one of our transformer stones, and I'm one of the 12 grandmothers who take care of him. And he actually, he speaks to me. So people will send me to him and sit with him and they'll ask sometimes questions that they would like answers from him. And so uh, he was given um, as a marriage gift uh, and he traveled from the Chilliwack Valley through marriage into down into the Sumas uh, Kilgard area is what it's called now. And originally there was a giant lake that supported the well-being of the indigenous people there, the Samath people they're called, or Sumas people. And um, he lived there until the turn of the century. There was a lot of uh, vigil anti uh, activity happening from the states. People were coming up and they were um, hanging the indigenous people. And one notable person was the lynching of Louis Sam, which is very highly documented. So everybody scrambled to get away from all of that, and they moved up into the mountains, further north and up into the mountains to hide from this kind of you know, horrible activity. And they left Tikwalatsa behind because he's a very big, huge, heavy stone, right? And they couldn't really move him quickly. And so what happened was some people from across the line in the uh, Western Washington state, it's now called, uh, saw him and didn't know what he was and, and so they, they took him into a, a shop that 
had curio uh, curiosities, and they charged people 25 cents to see all these curiosities, and he was one of them. And he sat there for a number of years until um, some ladies came from the Burke Museum, sort of like friends of the Burke Museum. It was a ladies group, and they said, wow, this guy's really curious, where'd you get him? So they told him the story, how he got there, and they said, well, you know, would you ever consider giving them to the Burke Museum, which is in Seattle? And so off he went on his journey, he went down to Seattle, and he sat in there in the basement, much like we are here, and he sat there for years and years until one of our um, anthropologists went down there to do some research and saw him in the corner, and he was just sitting there, and he said, that's that's like Tikolatsa. So they started one of the first um, repatriation uh, processes to bring him back home. And they took him uh, from uh, uh, the Burke Museum to the Nooksack. And they officially gave him back to us. And then the Sumas, he came across the border into the Sumas territory. Then he eventually made his way up to Stalo Nation. And while we were doing the work around that, I was sitting with my dad at one of these meetings and all of a sudden I heard, um, and this is why people send me because I can hear him sometimes, he'll say stuff. And so he said, all of a sudden I heard this voice in my head and it said, I need a cape. And I looked around and I said, Dad, did you just tell me you needed a cape? And he said, no, I didn't say anything. And I said, okay, this is very strange, right? So I, I asked, myself like what kind like out of cedar out of wool and not out of wool but cedar and so I, I afterwards I went up to the person who was like the leader of the conversation and I said okay this happened to me would should I make a cape and he said well I guess so if that's what he's calling for you better get busy right so I had no idea how to make a cape but I had a really big uh, Salish loom because I was learning how to weave swaka blankets. And so I thought, well, if I just get, get the, the cedar, I can just hang it down and just weave a lo loose kind of basket weave. And, and then we can wrap that around him to travel in. And then everything started to fall into place. My friend Brenda Crabtree said, oh, come over to my house. I've got a jerry stripper and we can easily get this stuff done. And my friend Muriel Roberts, who is also one of the caretakers said, I just got a feeling you needed help. Do you need any help with something? And I said, I do. And so she came over and she helped me weave it. And she went and she got this huge, beautiful string of rabbit fur that we put around it. And then we took it down there and covered and he traveled and he just wears it all the time. And then when people found out that he could, like he would say things to me, they, when he did this little traveling tour, like a rock star, right? And he, he went, they, I, they asked me to come and travel with him because, to make him feel like more comfortable, right? So I did that a few times. We took him up to Harrison. We'd take him to various places around the community, right? And he'd roll out of this big van and people would, people would like uh, go visit him and stuff. And, and then what happened was he, he ended up, I was teaching language in the Stalo Community Dev Corps office, which is on, was on the Chiatin First Nation. And so they wheeled him in there, and he was there the whole time I was doing language for, I developed the Halkamilam language program for my community, Chiatin. And so the, he was there for the first year, and the funniest thing that happened was we all left for holidays. It was like three weeks. We turned the lights off, and everything was empty. And I was the first person in there, and I walked into the room, this big boardroom, and he was in the corner. And uh, the Point family made a nice canoe for him to sit in. Uh, and, uh, and so anyway, I hear this, where were you? And I'm like hello, is there somebody in the room, right? Because it was kind of dark and there was nothing there. Where were you? And I went over and I went, oh, Tikolatsa, you, I was so lonely because he had gotten so much attention, I guess, right? And then all of a sudden, nobody was there. They all disappeared. Anyway, I said, we'll never leave you again, right? So we put him in a place where he's always like surrounded by people. Then oddly enough, I also developed the language program for the University of the Fraser Valley. And so I insisted that they move the language out of the college. It was then a college and became a university off the campus into Stalo Building 10, which is our resource center. It was a, it's a new building that was built. And I said, we need to have our language here. And then they moved him there. And so then he, I saw him every week and stuff like that. And, and uh, everywhere I go, everywhere, we, we were always seem to be together, right? So 
I don't teach there anymore, and I don't. I passed my teaching practice on to. I taught some other people to take over for me because I'm doing other work. But anyway, um, he's very powerful, and the whole reason he got changed into stone was because he was mis mistreating his wife. Somebody saw him. Hal's, which is our transformer spirit guy. Um, they said, look at, you know, they had this huge battle over and over. You have to stop what you're doing. What you're doing is not very nice. He wouldn't listen. So Hal's just got tired of fooling around and then he just whapped him and turned him into stone, right? So there, now you can deal with that because you're not doing that anymore. So that's how he, that's how he became, um, you know, stone. <laughs> so anyway, he's a pretty powerful guy and he sits there at the Stalo corporate development and and that's basically our first repatriation act that, that took place. And that happened probably about 12 years ago. So in the 90s, I think, was when it all began. Maybe, maybe in the early 20s. 20s. So he was, he was missing at large for nearly 100 years. Then he came home. So transformation is a huge part of our culture, hells and ha hells. Siwash Rock here is a transformation story. The mountains, the twin mountains are what they now call the lions were twin sisters and they were transformed into those mountains. We have up in Stalo territory, the uh, Triplique, who is married to Mount Baker or Kolshan, and they, they have uh, daughters, right, who guard and look after the well-being of the river. And so it's, our stories are written in the landscape and our uh, through transformation, a lot of them, and um, they're all super interesting stories. So that's the story we were talking about, a little bit more in depth, but uh, about Tekulat and transformation. And how is this related somehow to what you do here and there? <laughs> well, I guess in the just in the fact that like when I was a little girl I traveled up there a lot my father, my grandfather became a Fraser Valley milk producer he went to you know industrial school a lot of people went to residential school but he was indoctrinated into industrial school so he became a Fraser Valley milk producer him and his brothers so they gave the the government gave them all uh, between 60 and 80 acres of land to conduct this work and so when I was a child I was up there a lot helping on the farm and um, actually, the mountain Ola that we're going to look at, uh, I think, in, was sort of embedded in me by traveling up there. There was no freeway then. We'd go on this like side road, the Fraser Highway, It'd take hours to get up there, and then we spend the day. And my grandfather lived solely off the land. He didn't have running water until the '60s. He had no televisions or any. He had a radio, but you know, all the food was from the land, all the milk and cheese and eggs and everything. And, he would have pigs and stuff like that that he would butcher and eat. And he had Clydesdale horses. This is how he did all of his tilling. And so I think that my, uh, my appreciation and my love for the land and my uh, need to you know, thank the earth and for all that it gives us uh, came, I think, primarily from those early experiences. And I'm, I've never considered myself an Indian. You know, and I've never, absolutely never considered myself an Indian or a First Nations artist ever. And I even kind of revolt against calling myself an artist because I'm like so much more than that. Like it's not that simple is what I'm saying. And uh, I, and for me, I always say to people like, if I go into a gallery, I don't go, is that a German guy that made that? You know, I don't identify creative process with ethnicity. And that's why I'm saying that. It's not that I'm not proud of who I am and my lineage, because I have a very strong and very respected lineage, both from my mom and my dad's side. But to me, ethnicity is secondary. Like, I'm a citizen of the world and of the universe, and, and I'm here to honor the earth through these, these, this creative process. And I found this great way, and that I find very satisfying to do that. Yeah, so I think it's funny that but if you look up, if you Google me, for example, that's all it is. I'm Salish, I'm Kwakwaka'wakw, and that becomes the story, right? But that for me is, I've never ever promoted myself that way. I've just said, I make pottery. It's just as simple as I work with the earth, right? That's it. It's nothing, nothing more than that. So I'm a bit of a rebel that way. Like, 
<laughs> and and I kind of like because that's a very different notion than uh, than you know allowing you to me it's a way of being um, kind of just establishing the fact that we are all just people and that when we do that when we say give these labels we're dividing ourselves when really we should be searching for our shared commonalities and celebrating that. Like I'm all for saying who we are and recognizing and honoring our history, but that shouldn't be the sole focal point to make you look, right? This, this you should, you, it speaks for itself, it's its own identity. You know, it, it's not about me even necessarily. Something comes through me and here it is and I don't even know quite often how it happens. So these vessels are more like prayers to the earth and thanking the earth and capturing things that are unfolding in these very slow motion processes that are taking place around us all the time. I, I always love to say we are traveling at close to a thousand miles an hour and everybody thinks we're standing still, right? I love to say that over and over because it's like, gives you a perspective of like, oh right, we are tiny, we are small, there's huge, powerful goings on out there, right? And we have actually very little control over it. So I really like the fact that these kind of just, like when I begin to work, I don't know where I'm going, I don't know, I might say, oh, you know, I'm gonna start with an old, uh, big round vessel, but I never know how it's going to come out. And this might pop out and I'll go, whoa, wow, where did you come from, right? And the other great thing about these things is that markings come on them. So there might be birds, there might be people, there might be whales and ravens. And um, one time I was working for an exhibit at uh, the Institute of American Indian Arts Museum in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I'd never been there and I was really excited. And I made this really huge, big vessel about this big and I put this uh, light sort of pinkish slip on it. I took it out to Barnston Island where I was firing it. And when it came out, there was this woman who was sitting on her side and she was tending like a fire that was coming up. And all behind it was these big flat, what I learned were like mesas. And I thought, wow, look at that. And so I took it down, it was the last piece, and it was put on exhibit. And a fellow, uh, the Kornsteins at the Beas Artes Gallery, who was who helped, uh, ooh, that's the first time they saw it, and I became part of their stable of artists as a result of the show. But when they saw it, they said, wow, there's a woman. It was called The Lady in Waiting, but it's like, they said, look at that woman sitting there. And everybody, I put it in on the table at my in my studio, and they go, person sitting on there so it's not like I'm like making up a story right the, this stuff kind of just appears and it's like oh or another time we were firing and a huge owl started barking like a dog and my mom was with me she's really close we're very very close she travels a lot with me and I said mom what the heck is that she said oh it's an owl and it's a big owl she said it's sitting somewhere around here in the tall grass, she said, just wait, it'll lift up. And sure enough, it, it was just barking like, ah, 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 really loud like that. And I was like, oh, I've never heard anything like that. Sure enough, it was a big, huge barn owl. And it lifted up and it flew right over us. And the piece, there was only one piece in there, had this beautiful owl right across it. That was pretty much the main marking that was on there. So for me, these works are spirit works. These aren't Works of art, these are, these are transformation pieces. I, my thing that I say is just as I take from the earth, so must I give back. So it's inviting the elements, and I always say uh, a calling to, uh, to the stars and to the moon, to the sun, to the earth, and I thank them for being a part of this process of working with this beautiful, beautiful material. And then I never know how they're gonna come out. They're not glazed, they're burnished or polished with these stones. So at the leather hard stage, I hold them and I, I, pol I rub the surface. And what happens is it causes the clay particles to lay down, flush to one another and therefore reflect light. And then I embed them in sawdust. 
inside and outside and up above them and they can burn from two to four days very slowly and the carbon that's emitted enters into the surface and, and even a little bit deeper than that and it creates this smoke fire pattern that you can see and sometimes this rainbow effect. So um, they're, you know, they're not uh, closed off like a glaze closes it off. It's, they're very, very porous. And I also use natural occurring clay, glacier clay from Alberta. The Plainsman Company puts that out. And so the, the clay bodies are blended to get different colors and things like that. So again, it's not the chemically combined clay that I make up. It's actually dug and mined and then um, comes in these very smooth, the body that I use is very smooth, so when I burnish it. So they become very intimate, and I love, my, one of my most favorite parts is when you burnish it, kind of, when the stone glides over it, it uh, kind of clicks, it's got a sound, and you can hear inside uh, if they're round vessels, and they all have a certain pitch to them as well. Bob Dylan has one of my pots, and I wrote in this little note, I gave it to him, and, and I said, if you hum into it, find the key in it. And it, they really do, they have a real uh, resound, resounding sound that becomes a whole note, and it's very, the big, the big olas do. So they're very lovely, but yeah. So it's a different way of looking at the earth and working with the earth and becoming um, part of that process and so it connects me to that ethereal world right to a world you can't express or explain and that's what I like about it I like not knowing I, I like being surprised and not always being in control of everything and um, in that way recognizing I'm a part of a bigger a bigger thing I'm not just uh, I'm just not in it for myself. It's like it's, there's so much more to it than that. So, long story. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit more about the process of making these works? And sure. Well, I'm, I'm a hand builder, so I don't throw in a wheel. I do use a thing called a banding wheel, which just is like a little stationary wheel that you can turn by hand. But I also make uh, low dishes of clay that support the bottoms, because this kind of this kind of angle is difficult to make as a hand builder. And I'm not the kind of hand builder that uses, you might remember if you went to school and took art, you make these like what they called snakes or worms, right, where you would roll out coils. And I start that way, but I don't, I was taught by, m m one of my mentors was uh, a fellow named Fred Owen, who was uh, one of my instructors at college, when I went to college. And he went one step further and taught me how to make these belts of clay. So I don't put round coils on top of one another and sort of paste them together with slip made from the clay. I actually take them and overlap them and I uh, then compress, well, I compress them lightly and then I join them from the inside and from the outside and then I pinch them together. So this, this one here, you know, is just, I would say a good like 20 coils to get up to this, uh, this point. And it's a slow, very methodical process, which is something that I really like too. I really am a solitary creature, like I love quiet and I love being alone. And so um, this is very demanding because once you start, you can't really stop. And sometimes they take three or four days or this one here might take a week of me working on it. And then you're never guaranteed that it's not gonna like crack down here because of stress and drying points and stuff. You never know what's gonna happen. But uh, once they, they're finished, once I've done them, sometimes I use paddles to shape them. I use rubber ribs to help smooth them. Um, I don't directly uh, spray water on them. I spray water on the clay that I'm wedging to make the coil but I don't ever uh, water, what it does is it gets in and it loosens the clay body and it can weaken it and it wants to fall apart. So I use sponges to keep it damp and I use uh, t-shirt material to keep the rim 
um, from drying out and allow this to uh, dry, see if I'm gonna add another one on. And then I'll cover it with the, some plastic to keep it overnight. And so uh, once I've finished making them, they have to dry until what's called their uh, leather hard or bone dry. And uh, then I will po polish it. Sometimes if I've applied a slip, I start a little bit earlier to push the slip into the body. And uh, that might take maybe two or three hours, depending on the size. And then I'll we'll hold off, set it aside, go back to work on another piece, and then burnish it again. So I might burnish it once or twice. And then I let it sit and dry very slowly. So that means in a cool, dry, you know, dry uh, place. It doesn't, you don't want it to uh, dry really fast. And then I put it into a bisque kiln at 017 so that the burnish stays. And then from there, I um, take it out and I go to all my cabinet makers and I beg them for sawdust, right? And so I get a combination of hardwood and softwood and different textures, some very long, thin, and some powdery, so that it burns slowly and evenly over the course of a couple of days. And what I have is a very simple um, a red brick box. That's all it is with a tin cover. And sometimes I stack things on top of one another. Uh, I might put in four pieces depending on the size. And then I bring the sawdust up over them about this much. And I lay in uh, layers of newsprint. And then I start uh, the corners of it and let the newsprint light the sawdust. And then it burns down hopefully evenly and slowly over the two to four days. And then when you open it up, there's, there's no sawdust left at all. Maybe a little tiny bit on the bottom, but it all burns even from the inside. And then the bees are there. And it's like, oh, wow, look at that, right? And when you live with them, they sometimes there's images on them that you don't notice at first. I've lived with some pieces for maybe like four years. And all of a sudden, there's an image on it. And I go, well, like, where do those eyes come from, right? And there, there's some kind of like bird or some kind of image on there. And I've gone, wow, didn't see that, right? And so they, they kind of reveal themselves to you over a period of time as well. So that's pretty much the essence of the, the building part of it. Do you want to speak about the other pieces as well? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll sort of start by saying that when I first started, I, I went to, first of all, I went to you know, high school and I had a great art teacher and he's the one that introduced me to clay. Then I went to, uh, it was then called Douglas College, now called Quantum College. And it was the first year that it opened in 1970 and they had an art department. I didn't know really what I was doing. I was just sampling courses. But I always knew I loved pottery and working with clay. So they had a ceramic course, so I, I got involved in that. And then I moved to the Vancouver School of Art. Actually, I didn't want to go to the art school. I, I went to London, and I looked at the Royal Academy. I didn't like it. I felt it was a bit too stuffy. And then I went to Paris, and I looked in one of the schools there, and the language, and, uh, and then I went to Belgium, and I stayed in Ghent, and I loved the University of Ghent Art Department, and I really wanted to go there. And I had a little place that I was staying, and, uh, and I loved it. But, but the language was kind of a barrier, so I thought, oh, I, I don't know if I, can, if I can do this. So I ended up coming home. I was there for over a month, and, and then uh, I had a, a letter from the Vancouver School of Art saying that I could bring in my portfolio, and I thought, well, I'll try. And then, so they accepted me into second year. So I went and I studied there and I, find, and I got there. It was just then it was just a, a diploma granting situation. It's not like Emily Carr now, right? It's big, huge, like get your master's, right? And so, it, but it was a true art school. And now it's different. It's a different entity, but I loved my time there. It was just so wonderful. And then I started teaching. I started teaching and exhibiting and stuff like that. So in as far as how I learned how to do it, that's how it kind of all gelled together. And this is my 50th year of working with clay. So it's like I should have a little anniversary party, right? Get everybody over and they can all pinch pots for a while. <laughs> anyway, 
So I started by making these olas or trying to make these olas. So I was researching indigenous people's pottery making was my interest. And so I would write letters to people in the Southwest, all over the place where I could find Africa and try and get responses. It was this campaign I did at the art school. And sometimes people would send me letters and go, yeah, we do have a history of that or look here, look there. And so uh, oddly enough, uh, during the course of this time, I had come across a woman's name called Blue Corn from the San Ildefonso Pueblo in, uh, in just outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And later, I had sent a letter down there. I didn't receive a letter from her, but I had some clippings from some research that I had done. And then years later, lo and behold, she came and she did a workshop. I was living and studying with Tony Hunt and all the, that group. Northwest Coast Design and Carving, and these guys called me and said, hey, we've got this lady from the Southwest, you do hand-built burnish stuff, you, you, you should come and take the workshop. I said, I can, I'm like, I'm really working a lot in this area right now, but but I'll come and, and take them for down to my place for a barbecue. Tonight. Oh, that would be great. So I went up to Duncan, got them. I was living in Souk, and it turned out to be blue corn. This woman who I had researched, and I, had, I, did, had, I really didn't put two and two together that this is who it was until like years later. And she had just come from the San Ildefonso Pueblo where Maria Martinez and her husband were very, very well-known potters, uh, uh, brought back the pottery kind of renaissance of this, uh, this Pueblo pottery. And she said to me after we had uh, dinner, we went for a walk, and then we came back, sat by the fire, and she said, okay, I have a story to tell you. She said, I've just come from the San Ildefonso Pueblo, and Maria is not well. She's going to pass away, and she, invite, she invited me before I left to, to talk with her. She said, I ha I've had a dream. I need to talk to you, and they don't do that usually unless it's something that they specific that they want to talk to you about, and so she said, I, I understand you're going to Canada. I had a dream you're going to meet a woman. You're going to meet a woman there who's going to be very important to you in your life. So just keep your eyes open for it, right? And so, so she said, she looked at me and she said, I think you're that woman. And this comes from a huge, long line of like, and I was just so, I started crying. I was so moved because I knew who she was. Like she was just, she just makes these most remarkable vessels, right? And Blue Corn did as well. So the way spirit works like spirit works in very funny ways right and i'm not like i'm not talking spirit like re in a religious sense i'm talking about this ethereal way that we are connected through energy right and so stuff happens that you kind of go wow that's kind of weird how that worked out so she became one of my mentors and very close i went and lived in hawaii for 10 years and she i brought her over there to workshops and stuff and she was a wonderful, wonderful woman. And she did so well at her pottery making that she raised 10 children on her income. And her husband, who was a really fine silversmith, quit his job and started assisting her, right? Because she, she had so much orders and stuff. So she, had, she was a really great influence in my life. And just, she eventually adopted me into the San Ildefonso Pueblo as her daughter. So I was just like so honored, right? The way everything turned out. Yeah, stories. My life has been just a blessed, just an incredibly blessed life. Like, uh, it's carried me. Something has carried me. My dad says there's angels that are following me around and that kind of like guide me, right? And like, I'm the kind of person who says, I gotta have $10,000, I need a new car. Where am I gonna get it? And all of a sudden, within like a month, somebody will say, you know, I need you to do something for 10 grand. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Like, so I live by my wits, right? Like I don't, I'm not really into money yet. I have everything in the world I could possibly want. Mostly people have given me stuff. So I'm like this, you know, by the grace of whatever, I'm just like carried through life. And, and I have this just amazing, wonderful life. So I'm so thankful. And this has taken me all around the world, like to Italy and to um Italy and to Australia and to China and uh, so I'm super thankful like it's just been a very unusual you know exciting way to be part of it all.
So the other work that I'm doing, I'll just step out here and bring this guy over here. And I, this is called a mounting pole. And this one might be able to set up a screen. We'll see if it works. Do it this way. Every time I come here, I think of Lauren who's opening. And 3,000 people showing up for this opening. Never in the history, never in the history has that ever happened. And for him, before that happened, I, I was saying to him, okay, I always call him honey. Okay, honey, you have to practice for handshakes. This is going to be big, I don't know. So, and you've got to pucker up, kiss in the air every day and get callus slips so that you can take all those kisses people are going to give you. And so I made him do all this stuff and he just like, ha, 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 right? Like, and, but when that happened and he stood there and he told me he, I didn't come to the opening because it was just too big. I'm not really into that big kind of stuff, right? But, uh, all his family went and they said that he stood there and shook everybody's hand and I thought good on you, right? I I'm, I always tell everybody that story about that being funny because it really I don't know any other um, Kind of opening ever that would ever command something like that I think that one can sit on this one so my work started out with these olas the first thing was it took me years just to get something to, to what I call is like to sing, to sit up and just to become this beautiful, uninterrupted entity of space, like to hold space. And then that took me a long time just to get that to happen. And then when it happened, I started thinking about, I'm really inspired by pods and how pods come up. They you know, they show you your beauty like a rose hip. It's a rose, then it becomes a rose hip. And what's left of it is that holds the seeds is just so powerful. And then when it bursts and then it produces yet more beauty. And so I became interested in this notion of capturing that moment of just before a pod is going to burst. And so I started making these pods and then I got into making petals petals that unfurl and so that come up and I have a piece I'll show you at home of a petal unfurling and it's tall and to get the clay to kind of just sort of move but still be still was tricky and this process is really difficult like burnishing is not easy to do on these very delicate uh, things and also to satisfy her, it's very temperamental and so they can crack at any time it depends you know, um, just the form is a big part of it, how you wedge your clay and stuff like that. Uh, but they're tricky. They're tricky to get out. They're not that easy. So then I went from uh, olas, or big water round vessels, to pods, to petals unfurling. And then I started to produce, I traveled a lot, of course, with my work and shows and stuff. And when I was traveling in the airplanes, I... I always saw these beautiful mountains and I started to become inspired by the, the grand nature of mountains and their powerful entities. And so I just started whittling away. I don't make these very often. I feel sort of a calling to make one soon. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a new one. But um, I started out very small. Usually when I start on a segment of work, I start small and then I just slowly get bigger because it, it takes a great deal of stamina to... I work for 12 hour days when I start and I, I don't very often stop. I might get coffee and juice, drink coffee or eat as I go because they're, they require that kind of uh, focus, right? And then I just randomly carve away. But when I moved back to Chilliwack, to where my father grew up, to the same land where he grew up on, I realized that that whole area is one big bowl of mountains. And I thought, really, I think I've carried that from childhood. I think that you, driving in there and feeling that, I think that's really where these came from, these mountain oyas or olas. And uh, then I just do variations on that. So I really, there's about four segments of work that I've been actively working on. Now I'm working on uh, incorporating both 
petals and pods together. And I have one that I can show you that I've done. Um, and there's actually one called the Geometry of Space that's probably the best. It recently got broken. My work, speaking of transformation, it, it, it brings about events that sort of take place that require people to work on things together sometimes. And sometimes it's around them breaking. And other times it's um, people have come in, the biggest thing I've ever made is three feet tall by two and a half feet wide, which my mom has, which you'll be able to see. I have two big pieces like that. And I've only shown them twice, once at the Richmond Art Center and once at UBC, which is now called the Belkin Gallery. And I was standing there and there was people around and I walked up to see this big piece and the lady that was standing there uh, all of a sudden just burst out in tears. And I, 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 it was very shocking, right? And she just uncontrollably started, she said, I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm crying. And she didn't know it was me who made the piece, right? She said, I, I don't know what's happened, but I can't stop crying. I've had, other, had other people tell me that, but there's something there, I guess, that they feel intuitively and find it very moving. And I said, it's okay. It's just the way it is. It's like these things have like spirit all their own and they work, they're working on you, right? Like they're doing something and I don't know why. So when the geometry of space got broken by this guy who went in to photograph it, that brought about this huge, because it was the first piece of that and the collector who had it just cherished it, right? And he, he just did a funny thing. He broke a couple of her pieces and he, then he emailed me and wanted me to make another one for some like $200 or $300 because he had no money, but he's happy to trade for like photos and stuff. And I said, you know what? Your issue isn't with me and I'm not going to do that. You need to talk to the person who did, was part of their collection, right? Like, and that's what you have to deal with. So all these kind of funny little things, vignettes start happening around. And other people have told me that I think it comes in, like it comes in because there's stuff, there's work that needs to be done. That's what the Indians around here say, right? That there's work that needs to be done and you just have to like be intuitive about it and like get to work and get the work done, right? To sort of write it so that it doesn't get too long. But. So um, that's the newest direction that I'm working in is this combination of pods and petals uh, together. But all this has sort of brought me to a certain kind of stillness, right? Like there's, and it, it becomes about positive and negative space. When you work three-dimensionally, you realize that it becomes about what's inside the piece just as much about what's outside the piece. And lots of times, like for example, when you look at these, you can see the negative space that starts to form and that becomes uh, an integral part. So it's, even though it's hollow, it has, a, uh, it has a life in that hollowness, right? I've had people go, I, you know, when I lived in Hawaii, I was making these things where these fins were coming up and they were very sharp and stuff like that. And people were going, I really want to put my hand in there, but I'm afraid because it's just, it feels like it's going to bite me or something. So they, they sort of attract you to want to go in. And as a three-dimensional, you know, having three-dimensional concerns, I want your eye to go not just surface quality, but I want it to go like all the way around inside and then come back out again. It's not just about the externalness. It's really about capturing negative space is what I'm working on and how that creates this external kind of thing. So uh, even it, with these bigger things, it's, it's still that inside space, right? And seeing uh, across it and having your eye come in and kind of out and around it. But uh, I... I'm just so thankful that I started, I was just 16 when I started to work with clay. So I'm so thankful that I was able to find something that I truly, truly love and that I cherish the opportunity to thank the earth 
and also um, that they have a life of their own and that they can go live with other people, right? And uh, they can accept them for whatever, whatever they're about for them. So life is, uh, life is good. I, I always say I mentor a lot of people and I have taught all my life. So I've taught like thousands of people probably over the years. And I always say to people like, the, when, when you're born into this world, you are born with gifts. You're born with a gift and it's up to adults to nurture that gift and to guide that gift. And basically our children are our teachers. We're here not to make them conform, but rather to watch for their inner beauty, to encourage their gifts to come out so they can reach their fullest potential, their fullest sentient beingness, right? And it's so unfortunate that in this day and age, we don't do that with our children. We, we want to make them become a, a part of the society and we don't accept them on their terms and just go, wow, look at you. Like, you've got this incredible stuff and encourage that. And I was lucky, my parents did that for me. My parents never told me what I could or could not do. They just stood beside me and let me feel my way through life. And that is the hugest gift anybody can give to a young person is to just be there as this guide for them. So I was so lucky and thankful, and I'm so thankful that I was able to do that. And to, and I think that's part of the creative process, right? Is that you're given that gift and that opportunity to explore things um, on your own terms. So it's, uh, it's, and it's truly a wonderful experience to do that. And I'm really thankful. <laughs> in a pottery shell <laughs> but um, yeah is there any questions that you have? That's perfect I think yeah. I, I, I think there's one other thing I would like to add when I think about it and that is when I moved back to Chilliwack I, I ended up being there by a quirky way my parents were supposed to go there and build a house my dad had a stroke he couldn't he needed to stay down here and so I ended up there and I became part of what's called social housing. My name came to the top of the list miraculously. I never wanted a house. I didn't want that responsibility. My mom kept saying, you need to have some stability. I want to know you're going to be safe. You're going to always have a roof over your head. So you should really take this opportunity. You can have the land that, you know, uh, grandpa's land and build the house there. And, you know, I just think it's the right thing to do. So she talked me into it and I ended up moving up there. And so when I went up there, I was sitting in this big, huge, empty house, and uh, I said to myself, what do you want to do? Like, do you want to come and go and fly all over the world like you've been doing, which has been a really great life uh, with your work? Or do you want to become a part of this community and honor your father and your ancestors who worked this land and became a part of the community? My dad was a really respected guy. They always wanted to come him to come back and become the chief he was just really loved and thought highly of what do you want to do and I said I need to honor my dad so I did and my life changed uh, my life changed very unexpectedly I I decided to set my work aside because I was really well established and I thought that's what I need to do so I applied for a 10 buck an hour job at the band office and I became the first ever uh clerk receptionist and so my that was uh, connected to a big community center so I got to know everybody not only in Chiacton community but all of Stalo Nation because they would rent it for big events and I became the the girl who answered the phone right and I did that for two and a half years and while I was there I kept getting these faxes learn your language learn your language over at Stalo Sholi come and learn your language and I thought wow I should do that, but I don't, I don't think I can. I don't think I'm smart enough to do that. For some, it, kept, it kept pulling and pushing at me and pulling and pushing at me until one day I went, Laura, how are you going to know if you can do it if you don't try? So get out there and try. 
So I did, and as soon as I did that, the language got a hold of me. And I ended up going back to school, to university, and I got an honors degree in linguistics and curriculum development. I set my career aside for like 20 years. I still did work, but that wasn't my main focus. I went to my community, asked them they didn't have a language program. I developed the Chi Acton language program. After 10 years, I secured like a $10,000 budget and we did all kinds of stuff together. I, I got enough for two classes a week. And I said, okay, it's time for you guys to get a new teacher. I, I have to do something else now and you're perfectly capable of doing it. You need better and more experience. And so they did, they went and found a new teacher and it's still going 20 some years later, it's still going. And then as soon as I did that, the university, I was recommended, it posted a job to, for a health mail and language at the, it was then a college, it became a university. And so I was asked to apply for the job. So I applied for it, got the job and spent 10 years developing um, 14 accredited courses in Upper River Health and Malum. And uh, it's a program that I did with the elders. I studied with six fluent speaking elders. And so I don't consider myself the doer of it, like I'm the coordinator of this project with the L, it's the elders voices and uh, yeah, I can speak the language not nearly to the degree that they can. But still that program exists and it's still there and then after 10 years I said, okay, get yourself a new teacher, it's time for you guys for a new experience. But I still do a lot of mentoring, I mentor on Skype and Zoom and I also mentor uh, people just in creative in creative ways, like through the arts and stuff like that. So I'm still very much a teacher and very active with the language and do language pro you know, projects for Emily Carr and stuff like that. But, uh, but I'm no longer creating programs. It was exceptionally hard work. It was, and I really had to set everything aside and just, it's like being a dog with a bone and going and just gnawing on it and just keep going. and dead tired, but I'm just gonna keep doing it. I'm very tenacious when I start something. And and I, I think out of all the things I've done, that's some of the things I feel so good about because our language is hanging by a thread. And we have language speakers, but they're not fluent speakers. They're language learners and we can speak pretty good. And we can express the majority of the thoughts that we want to. It takes us a long time sometimes to coordinate our thoughts but mostly it's because we don't have people to talk to. So I work very much in isolation when I'm not teaching, but I'm still actively working with the language and encouraging uh, ancestral language acquisition every chance I can uh, get. So that's also been a really huge part of my life and, al and always will be. And it's been very, um, very gratifying and very, you know, very satisfying to be able to give back to the community, right? And I gotta tell you, moving back to the reserve, oh, what an experience. Like, I've never, my entire life, like I grew up off reserve. Um, I was never an Indian, I was just a kid, right? And, uh, but there I, there was so, there's so much racism, so there's so much poor, poorness, around and it's just it was a huge eye-opening experience to become a marginalized person where I was never a marginalized person before I had this big wide open life and I really learned firsthand and I always say you know you can't really talk about indigenous people unless you live with indigenous people and you understand how still difficult it is to make your way or maneuver your way through this lifestyle um, in, a, in an e easier way. Uh, so I'm, I'm not, I don't believe in reconciliation and I don't, I call it REC, like W-R-E-C-K and, and silly nation is what I say it is. Because I, I think that I have nothing to reconcile 
uh, everybody else has to do the work and it's up to you to figure out how you're going to do that. It's not up to me. It's not in my concern. I'm living with it every single day of my life and I've learned to cope. So it's not my problem. It's very much your problem. And don't come to me and ask me to tell you how to resolve it. That's your problem too, right? So I'm not involved in any of that. I feel like it's almost a detrimental process. Like when we talk about missing and murdered women, it's, it opens up these huge scarring, gaping, hurt. People are crying in circles about the people they have lost. They write reports about and put all that money in there, but nothing's done. It's still going on and nothing was resolved except we're still sitting around in a circle crying about it. And I think that that's another form of um, hypocrisy, right? It's like, why are you forcing us to talk about and cry about this again? We've already done it for years and years and now we're doing it in public and holy, it's just not fair. So I can't, I don't get behind any of that stuff. But what I do is try and be positive and learn the language, learn the culture, learn the protocols and the things that need to be passed on and try and help in that way, right? And so I'm not reconciling anything. I'm a firm believer. If you have to say you're sorry, like you just shouldn't have done it in the first place. Like that's what you need to deal with. And by saying sorry to me, all that does is make you feel better. It doesn't help me. And I'm probably not going to help you. But so don't don't say that to me. Just get the job done, right? Figure it out how you how you can do it. And that's that's how things are going to become to a better balance, right? And that's the learning curve that people have to go through. And it's hard and difficult. It's not easy. But but it but the work needs to be done. That's my little rant on reconciliation. Reconciliation. But, yeah, I stand really firmly. But, you know, I love people like Lawrence and Judy Chartrand who stand up and just call it, right? And it's harsh, and it, it hurts. It hurts, but that's just an inkling of the hurt that's carried by so many Indigenous people. But, but I think, too, you have to think big. Like, you know... We are here, we're on a time continuum through the course of history and the universe, universal time. And everything that is being done and has been done to us has been done to every other culture along the line. And everybody has experienced this. It's just that we're the newest kids on the block that have gone and have to go through this. And I always think that in a way, to be positive about it, it teaches us resilience, like it, and it teaches us compassion, and it teaches us how to become more compassionate citizens. Because when you see the damage that's been done and that gets revealed, it, if you look at it from a point of view that we've all experienced that, it's reminding you that we don't have to do that, that here we are again, and we need to deal with that and remind ourselves that that's the things that we need to pay attention to. And that we are basically here and stronger than we've ever been. We've not gone away. We hold all this cultural knowledge about plants and medicines. That's the other thing that I'm into is ethnobotany and medicines and stuff. But it like, we are still the holders of all this incredible ancestral knowledge. And if people actually gave us the credit that we deserve, they would be way better off for it. There's so much good teaching and good understanding that we've been given to caretake and to nurture, and we're still doing that work. Like I say to people, there are people in longhouses up and down this coast and inland that are dancing. There's 500 people in the winter ceremonies. They're all dancing for your well-being because they're dancing for the earth and for spirit. And they're covering you in all this goodness. And they're still doing the work, right? And you need to be aware of that, that they're still out there taking care of it. And that's what affords you this great life that you're having, right? You don't even know that work's going on. 
I look in my backyard where all that land was taken care of my grandfather and my uh, cousins have developed it and there's gated communities. And I look out there and I go, you people don't even know that you're laying all over and sleeping all over my grandfather's good intentions. Like you have no concept, but he's basically afforded you this incredible life that you're living there. And you don't know that, that there's, there's that life, that underlying tissue of life that's taking place and supporting you through spirit, right? And through other people's good intentions and dedication to tilling the land and caring, caring for it, right? So we need to always keep in mind that we're part of a huge thing and to try and be more open and caring about that and nurturing those kinds of conversations rather than focusing on that all the time. Goodness has come out of that bad stuff and we are stronger for it. Look, I'm here, right? And I've managed it really good. So I think it's really important for us to also see and focus just as much on that side that then this, this negative kind of pointing out these difficult things. Yeah, so that's my little rant on that part. <laughs> anyway, I, I want to thank you uh, for your time and for your interest. And I, and I hold my hands to you to thank you because it's, it's an honor to you know, meet you and to talk with you. And of course, Karen, who I love dearly. And, and always thank you for your good work. I know how hard you work and, uh, and care. So I want to thank you for that as well. I really, really appreciate it. And everybody, all the bones of the ancestors that live in here, they appreciate it too. Like they see the good work that you guys do, right? Like they know it's coming from a really good, a really good place in your heart. So I thank, I thank you for that. Thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah, you're very welcome. Or do we get it in our time? How are you doing for time? As long as you need. Oh, well, no, we're good. I, I'm good. And then when you, we're, I'm going to take them up to my place and, and uh, scoot around and stuff. And, uh, Wonderful. Thank yeah. you so much. Jeff. You're very welcome. Thank you. It's just an honor. Yeah, using my purse before I forget. <laughs>